Hi, everybody. Hello. Happy Monday. Two weeks to Christmas. Today. Two weeks from today. Today. Christmas two weeks day. from today. Yeah. Well, guess what that means? No what? class in two weeks. Oh, yes. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's right. And yeah, no yeah, class yeah. in three weeks, too. No, that's New Year's Day. I know. So this yeah. is class that day. Yeah. yeah. So we'll resume on January 8th. Yes. I got a slide about that, and I'll talk about it again. But it yes. should be self-evident, right? Yes. It should be. And while Scott has been working all morning on St. Andrew things and prepping for the class, I finally, finally have started putting up Christmas ornaments. And it's emerging all over the house yes, now. The house is undergoing that metamorphosis. It's crazy. If you came in right now, I'd be super embarrassed. I've got every room looks like it's destroyed. Now, why would you be embarrassed? Well, the only thing that's done is Just my Just because it's in progress. Room. Oh, that's what Scott keeps My whole life me. is in progress. <laughs> But you all know that I keep my Christmas tree up year round. So this has been the weirdest thing that I've had the ornaments off for the fall slash Halloween um, tree for quite a while. And we've just had a plain little tree sitting in our living room for weeks and weeks. But it's lovely. I like the lights. And, and what kind of tree will it become after Christmas? It'll be just a short wait and that will be a Valentine's there tree. There go. Yeah. And she's ready for it all. This is my woman. <laughs> My woman. Okay, so hey everybody. So we're back to the book of numbers today. Um, yes. I hope all of you were able to be at um, church yesterday morning at St. Andrew. What a spectacular day. It was. it was so wild to come there for just a, you know, it's a 930 service in Advent, which is actually not the busiest time of year historically. Historically, it's January, but every seat was taken. Third Second balcony, all down the sides, people sitting under the screens and those oddly placed chairs. Yes. I mean, everywhere we could stuff people, we That's were right. stuffing people and from yesterday. from where we were sitting, we could see what was happening as people got up to the third balcony. I will tell you, Scott has not coughed only one time Yeah, the I'm really doing much better. Day. I'm just clearing a little bit. I had some coffee here. That's a Bobby. Nothing, though. Not a cough. So well, that's he's not quite getting, true, but... You one, haven't heard it. One cough. No. Okay. Anyway, well, anyway, go ahead. Anyway, people were standing. I know some of you sit on the floor and you might not have been able to see them, but there were people standing way in up the at third the top balcony. Of the yeah, way up there. Well, at the what I call it the third level. Yeah, yes. I know. It's awesome. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. Awesome. I mean, that's not crazy. It's wonderful. Yes, and then we it had just... a wonderful, um, very well-attended potluck yesterday, yes. and I think everybody left feeling full and happy. Um, delicious food as always all across the church it's just so much yes energy the spirit was moving with so much enthusiasm and power and just wow there's just everywhere everywhere you look at St. Andrew right now it's just it's all on fire it is and it's, it's great a wonderful thing we it's hope great. you all are doing well in this Advent season as we get ready for Jesus's birth and it's hard sometimes to stop and just take a minute like this to study the Bible because we're all into, did I get enough presents? Is the house decorated? Blah, blah. It's so much stuff to steal our time away from where it's supposed to be. But today, yes. today, they are really on the road. They're on the road again. Yeah. On the road again. So yes. this is going to happen. They're actually moving today. That's so right. it's great. Um, We're so, so glad you're with us. Yes, really. so great. So shall I open us up with a prayer? Yeah. Okay, let's, let's do, do it. it. Mm -hmm. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we are grateful to be here again on this Monday and able to do this virtual class in which we can come together and study your word just to carve a little time out of our busy week to, to, to contemplate scripture, to talk about um, you and, and your work in this world and our place in this world and um, we'll, we'll, we'll do all of that again today. And we just, we know when we do this that your spirit is with us and we are grateful for that. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Word to Scott. Word to Patty. Oh, I am turning off that heater. It is Please hot do, here. yeah, yeah. I left, only left it on for you. Okay, and I'm hot, so. Okay, yeah. you are hot, baby. Oh. Okay, yeah, everybody heard oh, that. Oh, don't See? anybody gag. Don't, yeah, she's going to say, don't, don't encourage them. Yeah, well, anyway. So, here's where we are, friends. Finally, finally, the Israelites are on the move from 
Mount Sinai. So let's just take a moment and let's kind of just review and talk about here we are because it's a very big moment. So I brought a little bit of um, slides on this. Let me get those going up here. Okay, so here we go. Everybody sees this. No surprise. Y'all can figure this out, but I still felt compelled to put a slide up. All right, so. Okay, I don't think that you and I were ever up there today together. <laughs> where? Sure. Where were where? I don't think we were ever up there. I think it just said, welcome to Scott's class. We might not have been. Yeah, I don't think we were. You're right. And gosh, we look so cute Yeah, y'all missed it. Wait a minute. <laughs> you want to come back over here, Patty? Oh, sure. Okay, here we go. We're such, we are such goofballs. Okay, so after the Exodus, after the flight from Egypt, God, remember God? Uh, oh, we could see us. Laura Wolf said they could see us. Oh, I'm so glad. Okay, Gosh. all right. Well, that was all wasted then. You got to see some more. <laughs> so, so um, they they made God led them right because God's remember that that word theophany, um, which is that's not really a ten dollar word. It just means the manifestation from God in the cloud by day and the cloud of fire by night um, as depicted in the Ten Commandments with Charles and Eston. God led the people from um, the Red Sea downward to Mount Sinai, which is the mountain where Moses met God in Exodus 3. When, God, when Moses saw the bush... That was burning, but not being consumed by the fire. So that that that's a key little connection to keep in mind that the 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 mountain they go to after the Exodus is the mountain of Exodus three, with the with the burning bush, burning but bush that isn't being consumed. And there they um, are given the Ten Commandments and additional law. The law is sort of begins to be laid out in the book of Exodus at the foot of Mount Sinai. And there they get the instructions for the tabernacle and they build the tabernacle, this movable tent that will be God's dwelling place. And then um, sort of the way the books of the Bible work, after the book of Exodus, you get the book of Leviticus, which lays out much more of the law this would be the legal code that governed Israelite society, governed it under God's instructions and, and God's rules. And when the book of Numbers opens, they are at the foot of Mount Sinai, and we had all these chapters of them getting themselves organized. And God laid out, you know, what they were to do and who, which, who was to... Um, camp where, and we saw that the camp was, um, that the closer you got to the tent of meeting, the tabernacle, the holier it becomes, and so only the the sons of Aaron, their families, and the sons of Levi, they're going to be the priestly clan in among the Israelites, they live directly around the tent, and then further out are the other other tribes and kind of laid out like this and then we got then we got all of the long counting of people and the instructions about the levites and all these things so they could have an orderly march i'm going to use the word march i don't think it's a stroll an orderly march an orderly way by clan by tribe to get from mount sinai to the promised land. So that would look, whoops, yeah. here we go. All right, so then they head north, northeast. And it took them only a few months, maybe, to get down to my, Mount Sinai. They, are, they spend more than a year there because they're in the second year there when we uh, begin the book of Numbers. And then they, then they proceeded northward and the idea is they're going to go north and they're going to go all the way up there to <coughs> to Canaan up there by the Dead Sea and the Jordan River and the Sea of Galilee and stuff so they 
they head off in that direction. And that is what has begun really in chapter 10 and is going to be in earnest at chapter 11. The surprising thing to you, I suspect, will be that they don't, I mean, it doesn't take long to get there. I mean, it really kind of begins really at the beginning of chapter 11, and they're there by chapter 13. So it's not a, it's not much space in the book of Numbers, and it doesn't ha it doesn't take them, you know, 40 years to get there or something. That's not the story. You'll see the story laid out here in the book of Numbers. They make a beeline from Mount Sinai up to the Promised Land, right, where God intends for them to enter the Promised Land. Okay, yeah. so... I guess that's one other thing I'll point out. Remember, a considerable part of chapter 10 was spent telling us how they knew when to move and where to move on this walk, sojourn, march, upward, northward. And it is God who leads them. God in the, in the nature of the ark is leading at the front, and then there is the cloud that would be God, the, um, God with them, the representation of God, this theophany with them. And when the cloud stopped, the people stopped and set up camp. When the cloud started moving, the people took up camp and moved on. So again, it is God leading them. I know Moses gets all of the press, and he should get a lot of it. But if we let that obscure from us, the fact that this is really God's deal, we will lose, we will lose the storyline of God's work in this world, right? In ways large and small, this this is God who has rescued His people, led them out of Egypt, led them to Mount Sinai, taking them northward now to the Promised Land. God, God, God the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Yahweh. So, does anybody have anything to add to that you would like to online? I I know... I don't see any um, comments One thing that um, Laura Patty? let us know is that Jonathan ran the marathon yesterday. Whoa. That's awesome. Did he finish? I am guessing he did, but she didn't wow. say. Maybe you can let us know. Man, that. that's impressive. That is 26 miles. Probably the only person in our class that comes on Sundays that could possibly have achieved that. He did. He, he did. Wow. It. Well, that is fabulous. You know, there's one other person in our class who's, who's run a marathon. And who was that? But she's moved away. Oh, Luann. Luann Dolly. Dolly and That's she was true. there yesterday, but, but, they, but they don't go to St. Andrew anymore. Three hours and 14 minutes. Oh, my gosh. So not only did he finish it, he's fast. Wow. Wow. Good for him. Wow. So for those of you who do not know Jonathan, Jonathan is a high school <coughs> senior. And um, he quite often, most weeks, comes to our class on Sunday with his mom. And um, How old was he when he started coming to our class, Patty? A little Six? boy. A little boy. Yeah. Five? Something like yes. that. And he yeah. is such a and, wonderful young man. Completed his eagle thing last year. Just uh, eagle scouts and yeah, he is anyway. great guy. Great guy. All right, everybody. So we are at Numbers chapter eleven, verse one. They are setting out basically, and sadly, you won't be surprised by what happens. And we're going to connect a few dots today too. Okay, so chapter eleven, verse one. Now the people complained about their hardships in the hearing of the Lord. And when he heard them, his anger was aroused. I just, you know, it's just, it's such a wonderful way to put this. You don't have to get lost in theological discussions of doesn't God know everything and all this stuff? Just get to the relationship part of this, right? God and his people live in a genuine relationship. He dwells with them in the tabernacle. 
that's furnished with things that dwelling places are furnished with. Light in the can <coughs> in in the candlestick, food in the bread of the presence. So <laughs> I almost said air freshener Ooh. in the in the incense, but I just ne never wanted to losing my mind. Anyway, so yes, and you can connect it to Jesus. How do you connect it to Jesus? You could go to the first chapter of John. And it's, you know, we say the word, the, the word be, in verse 14 of John 1, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word there is actually, it's actually the word became flesh and tabernacled among us to give us this connection between Jesus coming to dwell with God's people, with humanity, and God dwelling with his people as they are making their way to the promised land. The word became flesh and tabernacled among us. So the people have complained. God has heard their complaints and his anger is aroused. They are what? They are ungrateful. Ungrateful. This is, these are hallmarks of a real relationship. God is not some, you know, the, un, the first mover of Plato who is untouchable by relationship or love or emotion or anything. Um, I remember I was teaching a Sunday school class with the singles and one of the young men said, well, God obviously doesn't have emotions. And I asked, well, why do you say that? Because he viewed emotions as being something that makes us, you know, less than who we should be. Well, that's, I don't think that's right. It's not, it's, I know it's not right. Of course, having emotions doesn't make you a lesser person. There are things in this life that we should get angry about. Are there not? Yes. Of course there are. This, this stark, explosive demonstration of that is October 7th in Israel. How, how could your righteous anger not be kindled by that? It should be kindled by that. So, the people complain. Oh, that is the story of the Exodus. They, they, they leave Egypt, they go into the Sinai wilderness, and right off the bat, they start complaining. So here they are, they leave the foot of Mount Sinai, to make this journey northward to where the promised land and they start complaining. Well, then, continuing in chapter 11, then fire from the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outskirts of the camp. So what are we supposed to think of that? Right? Okay, so... So God is now angry with them and the fire of God, the holy fire of God consumes some of the outskirts of the camp. It's like the camp gets singed around the edges or something. Yes. So why don't you go, we're, these are some of the dots we're going to connect. Go to Exodus. Ah, it's God. Go to Exodus chapter 33, verse 1. I'll get there. This is during the encounter between God and Moses when Moses has come down the mountainside and seen that while he was up with God for 40 days, the people have abandoned Moses and they've abandoned God and they have made a, a golden calf. And it's just this dark, dark black moment. So, Exodus 33, verse 1. Then Yahweh said to Moses, Leave this place, you and the people you brought up out of Egypt, you, not, no, you brought up out of Egypt, and go up to the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, 
I will give it to your descendants. I will send an angel before you and drive out the Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go. That's what God says. I will not go. I will not go with you. Because you are a stiff-necked people, that means a rebellious people, an ungrateful people, a, a people who won't listen to God. Because you are a stiff-necked people, and I might destroy you on the way. Well, what does that mean? It means that God is holy, and the people are not, and they can be consumed by God's holiness. That's the risk. That's the problem. That's why you have the priests and the sacrifices. That's, those are ways to try to deal with this fundamental problem that God is holy and the people are not. Like we live on the earth basking in a fraction of the sun's warmth, but if we got too close to the sun, we would be consumed. Consumed. Um, I don't have an NRSV. Well, do I? Will it do this? Hang on one second. I'm going to try something. Yes, it will for you. Okay. I just want to see something right here. Um, I'm going to my NRSV. Ah, you see, this is a better translation. So I know almost all of you are like I was with the NIV, but this is one of the little places where, now here's what the NRSV says. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up among you, or I would consume you on the way, mm -hmm. for you are a stiff-necked people. I like that that word consume expresses better this idea of, of an unholy people getting too close to the holy sun, S-U-N. The CEB says? Yes. But I won't go with you because I would end up destroying you along the way. Yeah, that's you like the are NIV. A stubborn people. That's like the NIV with this, I, like, I will destroy you, but yes. it isn't really... I would consume you is, is I think, to me, a, a better better way sort of theologically to think about what's happening. I so, like that they use the word <laughs> stubborn, though. <laughs> yeah, stubborn is really good, well, rather than stiff-necked, right? Right, yes. Kind of gets it, because they are stubborn, like, like we are. So go back to Numbers, back to Numbers 11, right there, and... and and so, yeah, so they've been, they've been ungrateful. God's gotten angry. Their, their unholiness has burst out. And the outskirts of the camp have been consumed. Okay? Even here in the NIV, it says, and consumed some outlying parts of the camp at the end of verse 1. So, that's why sometimes the translators need to need to keep these words consistent. Consume is a perfectly satisfactory word and and use the same word here as you used in chapter 33 of Exodus because they're connected. But the people cried out to Moses, verse 2, and Moses prayed to Yahweh and the fire abated. So that place was called Tibera, because the fire of Yahweh burned against them. I think the word in Hebrew means fire or something like that. I checked it, it does. So, verse 4. The rabble, the rabble among them. You know, you got, we'll just use the, we'll just use the numbers that we have here in the book for Exodus. We got like 2 million people. 600,000 men and all the attending women and children. Two million people. So do you think two million people are all of one voice and mind about everything that's going to happen? Uh, no. Of course not. <laughs> of course not. Of course not. So is everybody among among the two million 
peace-loving, seeking to spread gratitude and thankfulness and joy. No. The world was broken then. Remember, this is all post, post the rebellion in the garden. So these people were as broken as we are. That is what comes to play throughout the Old Testament. You see it played out time and again. So here there is among the group a rabble. The rabble among them had a strong craving. And the Israelites also wept again and said, If only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we used to eat in Egypt for nothing. Like we'd just go down to the river and pick it out. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks. You know what a leek is, Patty? Not really. It's a long, skinny, onion-like vegetable. Okay. I looked it up. Because I hear them talk about it on cooking shows. Uh, yes. Which, <laughs> why I watch cooking shows, I have no idea because I don't cook. But anyway. We're into it, though. <laughs> yeah. The leeks, the onions, the garlic. But now our strength is dried up and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. Okay, so we're to the manna now. What's the manna all about? So let's connect a dot. Just so this is so you can tie pieces and get used to moving around your your Bible. So go to the book of Exodus, chapter 16. Linda, no, he's back in the NIV. Oh, wait. I, sh I will be in a second. Thank you, Linda. I hadn't yet. I hadn't reverted. And now I'm reverted. Okay. The gravel with them began to crave other food. I like the word crave. And again, the Israelites started wailing and said, If only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. The cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, garlics. But now we've lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manna, this ah, this manna stuff. So go to the book of Exodus. So you need to know where the manna story is. It's just one of those little memorization pieces that's really helpful. The story of the manna is in Exodus chapter thir chapter 16. I almost said the wrong thing. Actually, I sure, sure but I get this right after what I just said. Right, Patty? It's called manna and quail, so I think you're right. <laughs> <coughs> now, this is the story in Exodus 16 of how the people are complaining, parallel to the story in Numbers, they're complaining about being hungry and nothing to eat, so God gives them the manna. Now, this manna is a substance which appears on the ground every morning, and they are to go out and to collect it and take it home, and it is to sustain them. Out there in the desert, that's where they are. They're out in the middle of nowhere. They're in the desert. And a couple of things about the manna. You can't store it. It won't keep. So you have to go out and get it every day. It becomes their what? Their daily bread. Daily bread. Everybody, no matter how much work and time they put in or how little work and time they put in, everybody gets what they need. That's just how it works out. They all go out and get it and they come home and they say, well, I've got what we need. Right? So, and this now they have been doing for a long time because they did it on the journey to Mount Sinai. They've done it during their stay at Mount Sinai. And now they're doing it on the journey northward because they're still not in a position to plant crops and grow them and that sort of thing. So they are living off this manna in the book of Numbers. Now, also in, in chapter 16 of Exodus, we find out that God provides them quail. Okay, provides them quail. Now, look at verse 11 of Exodus 16. In the NIV, Yahweh said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them, at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am Yahweh, your God. 
And that evening quail came and covered the camp. And in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. And when the dew was gone, the thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. That's the manna. So evidently what has happened between Exodus 16 and Numbers 11 is that um, is that they're not they're still getting the manna but they're not getting the quail. But there's no story that I'm aware of. Again, we could cross sorts this out there, y'all. But there's no story I'm aware of where the quail is cut off from. It just it's just not there in the story in Numbers 11. So let's go back to Numbers 11. Okay. Verse, verse 6. But now we have lost our appetite and we never see anything but this manna. So they're tired of it. Some of them are. The rabble, the ungrateful ones. They're out in the desert. I mean, honestly, given our... I was standing in the grocery store the other day with Patty and I was just standing there for a few minutes thinking about how astonishing it would be for so many of the people in this world to walk into our neighborhood Kroger and see aisle after aisle and all this fresh produce. And it's all stayed presented so beautifully and it's fresh and case after case of dairy and meat and cheese and... <sighs> astonishing these people have been living on this manna stuff for a long long time so i am sympathetic to the fact that they would like more variety but <coughs> <coughs> then again they could have stayed slaves in egypt and this is what god is providing to them so be grateful it's verse seven now the manna was like coriander seed and looked like rosin. The people went around gathering it and then ground it in a heart in a hand mill or crushed it in a mortar. They cooked it in a pot or made it into loaves. So maybe you could turn it into a paste. Maybe you could, they probably learned to make different things. Maybe you like cream of wheat and bread and other things. They cooked it in a pot or made it into loaves and it tasted like something made with olive oil. Mm -hmm. Huh. Didn't say it tasted like olive oil. Just something like olive oil. When the dew settled on the camp at night, the manna also came down. So rather than now getting quail at night, they are getting manna at night. How long this has gone on and why, I have no idea. And I, like I said, I don't think we're told. Now, verse 10. Moses heard the people of every family, every family, wailing at the entrance of their tents. So the rabble has got everybody stirred up. The rabble rousers, right? The rabble's got everybody stirred up. Yahweh became exceedingly angry at these ungrateful wretches. And Moses was troubled. And he asked Yahweh, why have you brought this trouble on your servant, on me? What have I done to displease you that you put all the burden of all these people on me? Did I conceive all these people? <laughs> Did I give them birth? Why do you tell me to carry them in my arms as an earth carries an infant to the land? You promised on oath to their ancestors. Where can I get meat for all these people? They keep wailing to me. Give us meat to eat. I can't carry all these people by myself. The burden's too heavy for me. If this is how you're going to treat me, please go ahead and kill me. If I have found favor in your eyes and do not let me face my own ruin. So God's angry. 
Moses is upset. He feels abandoned by God. Too much responsibility for one guy. The people are all complaining. And just imagine, it's really not two million. Can't be two million. This is the ancient world, Cam. But gobs and gobs of people outside their tents. They've all they've all caught the fever now, where they got to have a more diverse menu. They want meat, meat, meat. Well, I think we all today would have done the same thing. Well, see, that's part of the that's part of it here, isn't it? Yeah. Yep. Yep. We have we have appetites. We have appetites for a lot of things. Appetites for certain foods, but appetites for lots of things. Some of them can be beneficial. Many of them are not beneficial to us. Many people are ruined by their inability to control their appetites for what? Almost anything right. can be a person's ruin, right? So here's the first thing God does. This is step one. Yahweh said to Moses, bring me 70 of Israel's elders who are known to you as leaders and officials among the people. Have them come to the tent of meeting that they may stand there with you and I will come down and speak with you there. And look, check this next part. I will take some of the power of the spirit that is on you and put it on them. Mm. Wow. Okay. They will share the burden of the people with you so that you will not have to carry it alone. This is like, for church pastors, this is like a home run passage right here. Right? Um, one of the things that we're blessed with at St. Andrew that I think is reflected in the energy of the community is the fact that we, we do have a strong staff. And we do have, among that staff, we have a handful of pastors, I think seven maybe right now, who who work together really well, who are ready to pitch in, and we have lots and lots and lots of lay people who will do anything that they ask and will volunteer to do things that nobody's even thought of yet. And we have great lay leadership in the church. And, you know, it, it saves Arthur from feeling like Really, it's all on them. He knows it's not all, all on him. It couldn't be all on him. He would be, he would be crushed by such a load. Um, Robert knew it wasn't all on him. So here it is. So Moses, God says, first of all, go get 70 elders. Bring them together. I'm going to take some of the spirit that I've given you, and I'm going to give it to them. Now, I don't think you have to think about this really as... You know, there's there's like a limited quantity quantity here, right? And so a certain percentage is going to take it from Moses and his thought. No, this is about the sharing in the spirit and in the responsibility. That's what this is about. And I think it's a, 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 a wonderful. Wonderful passage, a great way to put it. I will come down and speak with you there, Moses, and I will take some of the power of the Spirit that is on you and put it on them so that they are equipped. You see, nobody who... Every person, every Christian is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit tabernacles in every Christian. And the gifts that God gives that Christian, well, they vary from Christian to Christian. <coughs> I'm sorry. In the Old Testament, God tabernacled in the tent of meeting. Not the same. So, it's one of many things that change with the coming of Christ. So here, the Spirit is going to be shared among now another 70 people besides, 
besides Moses, so that they have the Spirit who will work with them and encourage them and help them make better decisions so that they will have the Spirit of God um, helping them, empowering them. so that they will be able to share the burden. So verse 18, to Moses, this is God to Moses. Now tell the people, consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow when you will eat meat. So there's a lot of things happening because God has made, oh, what, an organizational change along with the giving of his spirit but there's still the meat situation to deal with. So God says, Tell the people, concentrate create yourselves in preparation for tomorrow when you will eat meat. Yahweh heard you when you wailed. If only we had meat to eat. We were better off in Egypt. Now Yahweh will give you meat and you will eat it. You will not eat it for just one day or two days, or five, ten, or twenty days, but for a whole month, and until it comes out of your nostrils, and you loathe it. Don't you love that? Isn't that just like, wow. You know, these things are written so long ago. It's just like, are you kidding me? You want, you know, God will give you meat and you will eat it. You will not eat it for just one day or two days or five, ten, or twenty days, but for a whole month. And it all comes out of your nostrils and you loathe it. I like the word loathe. I don't know why. It's just you loathe it because you have rejected Yahweh. Who is among you and have wailed before him saying, Why did we even leave Egypt? This whining and complaining stuff, I know you're going to say to me, Well, they're just being, being human. No, they're being less than human. The most human ever was Jesus. These people have descended into whining and complaining against their rescuer. They wanted nothing more than to be rescued from Pharaoh. Now they have been rescued from Pharaoh. And what do they start doing? Whining and complaining. And now they've got their cravings. I'm glad the word was used, craving was used in here. They've got their craving that they want to satisfy. And they've got a craving for meat. So they're going to get meat. Until mm -mm. so it's coming out. Their nose, and they just, I'm going to say it only one more time, I promise. They loathe it because they rejected God. See, that's what our cravings do. See, let's just say that you feel like you're in a really good place with God. You can still be beset by cravings that will lead you off to far pastures and places where you shouldn't go. You know, these cravings for <sighs> cravings for money, cravings for attention, cravings for power, cravings for for <sighs> endless, endless list of just these cravings. And they can lead you they can lead you to ruin. So twenty one. But Moses said, Here I am among 600,000 men on foot, and you say, I will give them meat to eat for a whole month? Time and again, Moses really gets into a very intense, very genuine conversation with God. We see it here. We saw it, if we look back, we're not going to. We look back to Exodus 32, 33, 34. I mean, Moses basically has to persuade God to go on with them. It's a very it's a very honest relationship 
conversation. It's like when Abraham negotiates with God over the fate of Sodom and Gomorrah. Who is a mortal man to negotiate with God? Well, Mo Abraham was. Moses is. It tells you something about the very nature of God. And what God's desire is. God's desire is to be in a genuine relationship, a genuine love with his people. God wants to be loved by his people. He wants his people to love God. That is that is the relationship that 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 God seeks. So Moses is, says, Oh come on. How am I going to come up with enough meat to feed this entire crowd for a whole month? Would they have enough if flocks and herds were slaughtered for them? Would they have enough if all the fish in the sea were caught for them? And Yahweh answered Moses, Is the Lord's arm too short? That's a Hebrew metaphor for what? You think God couldn't do this? If you ever think God can't do something that would be good, because God defines what good is, then rethink it. Do you think, is the Lord's arm too short? Is Yahweh's arm too short to get this done? Ah. Now you will see whether or not I say, what I say will come true for you. Okay. So what do you what are you willing to bet? That uh, God does what God says he's going to do. They're going to get what God promised them. God is a great promise maker and God is a great promise keeper. Verse 24. So Moses went out and he told the people what Yahweh had said. He brought together 70 of their elders and had them stand before the tent, the tabernacle, the tent of meeting. Then Yahweh came down in the cloud and spoke with Moses. And he, God, took some of the power of the Spirit that was on Moses and put it on the 70 elders, just like he said. When the Spirit rested on them, they prophesied. Meaning for, for, for in, this, in the world these writing comes from, that means that they have a, um, some sort of ecstatic experience. Um, they're speaking, they're might be speaking something unintelligible. They um, might be speaking something that is in that is intelligible, but the it's it is it is it is God's mark on them. When the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but didn't do so again. This isn't their role. This isn't about them being trying to be you know, 70 more Moseses. This, they're supposed to get things organized and get things done. What is it a little bit like? We won't have to turn to it, but it's in Acts chapter 6. When the apostles are spread too thin and a problem comes up around widows who feel like they're getting cheated out of bread and they're hungry. And so the apostles designate seven um Call them deacons, seven men who will oversee the work of keeping things organized and getting the widows fed and settling arguments so that the apostles can proceed with their work, which is to proclaim the kingdom, to proclaim the good news. So when the Spirit rested on these 70, they prophesied but didn't do so again. Verse 26, however, two men whose names were Eldad and Medad, had remained in the camp. Ah, so only 68 were there that day, actually, with Moses in front of the camp. Now these two, Eldad and Medad, they were high, listed among the elders, but did not go out to the tent. Yet the Spirit also rested on them, and they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Joshua, that is the Joshua, the Joshua whose 
There's a book that carries his name in the Old Testament, but that is this Joshua. Joshua, son of Nun, who had been Moses' aide since youth, spoke up and said, Moses, my Lord, stop them. But Moses replied, Are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. You see, for me, that's this tiny little roadside sign pointing to the day when the spirit dwells in the hearts of, dwells in believers. When the Holy Spirit would dwell in the church. Right? It's, Moses is right here. He doesn't need to, there's nothing to be hogged here or kept only to himself. Wouldn't it be best if everybody had the relationship with God that Moses had? Wow. He's, he's thinking to himself. So, there's nothing to be done to me, dad, and L, dad. So, Moses, in verse 30, Moses and the elders of Israel returned to the camp. Okay? Verse 31. Now a wind went out from Yahweh. So Yahweh creates this wind and drove quail in from the sea. You ever seen a quail? I'm sure you have. I wonder if any of you have ever hunted quail. There's a quail, a little fat bird. Um, my stepdad, he might have hunted quail. He liked to hunt dove. I never understood why, really, because he would go out, bring home a few dove, and I'm talking about a few, and then he would dress it, and then he would pick all the little, you know, BBs out of it, the little shot, it's called, out of the little bird, and he would be left with these tiny little morsels of meat to eat, and I just thought to myself, well when I was a boy, gosh, you know, chicken's, chicken's pretty good. You can get it down at the store. It's all, it's already done and ready, but no, Francis did like the, like it's the process of hunting. So quails, they are these small birds that are hunted and are edible. And this wind from the Lord scattered them in verse 31, up to two cubits deep all around the camp. Now, there are a lot of funny measures in the Old Testament. A cubit is something worth remembering, that it is about 18 inches, roughly. A cubit's about a foot and a half. So that means this, so they're about three feet deep. You might stand up and consider that in the camp, there are quail now three feet deep. And as far as a day's walk in any direction. Oh, my goodness. How far could you walk in a day? I have walked 20 miles in a day for March of Dimes. Maybe I could have gone further, but I don't know. So Jonathan just ran a marathon, 26 miles. How far could Jonathan walk, Jonathan Wolf walk in a day? So... Three feet deep, extending out from the camp a day's journey. <coughs> Some ambitious biblical scholar tried to calculate the number of trail, 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 the number of quail <laughs> that you could fit into such a space. Three feet deep, a day's journey from the camp. Make all the assumptions, and the number he came up with was somewhere around 36 trillion quail. So this is really a story. Is the camp inundated by quail? Yes. Is there probably something hyperbolic about this? Yes. But it makes the point. They are getting quail, quail, quail. All that day, verse 32, all that day and night, and all the next day, the people went out and gathered quail. No one gathered less than 10 homers. Now that, my friends, 
it is somewhere around something more than 10 tons. A homer is a huge measure of weight. It's an enormous, it's an unthinkable measure of weight. They, it's not the point. The point is quail, 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 more than anybody could possibly handle. It's in abundance. Arthur wanted to preach this story one time, and he did. This was back in maybe, I don't know, seven or eight years ago. He said, I want to do the quail story. And it was on a Sunday where he wanted to talk about abundance. And so that's what, you know, so here we go. But the story isn't really about abundance. Okay, you got to think about this. No one gathered less than 10 homers. They, then they spread them all around the camp. But while the meat was still between their teeth and before it could be consumed, the ang anger of the Lord burned against the people and he struck them with a severe plague. Therefore, the place was named Kibrath HaHatava because they buried the people who had what? Craved other food. I remember working on this story seven or eight years ago when Arthur was um, going to to preach it. And I wrote that weekend. And I want to share with you a little bit of what I found in my work on this, particularly one commentator on this story. Because I think he... I think he was pretty well spot on. He said, A central goal in preaching and teaching this story is to determine what we crave in the contemporary church that puts us in conflict with God's teaching, God's leading. The object of our craving changes. The meat desired by the rabble may be money, employment, social prestige. The message of the story remains the same, however. God recognizes us by what we do. That's such a good point. If you want to look at where somebody's heart is, you look at what they do. We all know this, right? That's why parents say, you know, do what I say, not what I do. Well, that's, a, that's you know, kids know better. God recognizes us by what we do. If we leave the camp in pursuit of the thing we crave, then we may forfeit our identity as God's people. We die with the meat still in our teeth. I thought that was powerful. It's because it's, you know, at this time is, it's, it's just, there's always the offerings that the world has that want to call us out of the camp, call us away from God, measured to satisfy cravings that we all get from time to time. But chasing those cravings can be our ruin. It can ruin our relationship with God. It can ruin our lives, our families. Um, and But by golly, we're going to get it. And like he said, we'll die with the meat still in our teeth. So, it's a really good story. And you know, it's a, it's, Arthur was right. It's a very preachable story. You just have to make some connections and things to... To, to see what's really happening. It's really not, as Arthur, as Arthur pointed out, it's really not a story of abundance. It's a story about cravings for something other than what God has given you, has offered you, other than what you know is good for you. And now chasing after those cravings. You know, you can choke on it. So, thoughts, questions? OK. 
Okay. Verse 35 from Kibroth Hatava, Hatava, the people traveled to Hazaroth and stayed there. So they're just making that journey northward is what is happening. All right. Okay. Now, Miriam and Aaron. Now, look at chapter 12, first verse, Miriam, who are they? They are Moses' sister and brother. Or brother or brother-in-law? She is definitely his sister. Yes, okay. Aaron. Aaron, I thought, was his brother, but, boy, somebody could check it out for me, okay? You know, Miriam, we don't really know much about. People kind of assume that she was the older, his older sister who rescued him from the Nile River when he was a baby and stuff like that, maybe. But she, she is most noted for the song that she sings, at Exodus 15, and she is called, hence is called a prophetess, and Aaron is Moses' mouthpiece before Pharaoh, because Moses tells God, well, God, I don't speak very well, I'll get all tongue-tied, and God says, which is like one of uh, five or six excuses Moses gives God for why he can't do what God wants him to do, and God solves each problem, and what, having Aaron speak for him is one of them. And so Aaron does the speaking to, to Pharaoh. Um, God speaks to Moses, Moses speaks to Aaron, and Aaron speaks to Pharaoh is kind of how it works. It does say he, uh, according to Wikipedia, he was um, Moses' elder brother. Okay. So they are a, they became in Jewish legend, Mary and Aaron, much more significant than you find them to be in Scripture. Because they're like this triad, then this this three three sibling deal. Um, but Miriam is, you know, her like I said, her big moment is in Exodus fifteen. This is not going to be a good moment for her. Miriam and Aaron began to talk against Moses because of his Cushite wife, for he had married a Cushite. Now, that confuses every commentator out there when they're trying to figure out who are we talking about here. Because you might recall, if you've ever been through the book of Exodus, that Moses married a woman named Zipporah, and she was a Midianite. But Cush, C-U-S-H, was a land just south of, modern, south of Egypt, and Midian was in the same general area, um... And so is it the same woman? Did he take a second wife? Don't know. Wish I knew. But whatever it is, Miriam and Aaron are not happy about it. And now they've started talking against him. Talk, 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 talk. Pick a little, talk a little. Verse 2, quote, Has the Lord spoken only through Moses, they asked? Ah, now I get it. It's not about the wife. They're jealous. They're envious. Moses is the one who goes in and talks with God. Moses is the one who goes into the holiest of holies. And Moses encounters God and talks with God above the mercy seat in the tabernacle. Has Mo the Lord only spoken through Moses? They asked. Hasn't he also spoken through us? They're envious. Envious. Such a, such a powerful vice. It's one of the seven deadly sins. Um, the best concise definition of it is feeling bitter when others have it better. Feeling bitter when others have it better. And the great example in, you know, storytelling in the past few decades is the movie Amadeus. Right? Salieri is embittered, embittered, murderously embittered, perhaps, against Mozart. Because Mozart has been given a talent by God that was not given to Salieri. And Salieri is enough of a musician to know it. And so it makes him envious. And it just eats him up, eats him up, eats him up feeling bitter when others have it better. And here Miriam and Aaron are envious. And the Lord heard this. Verse 3. 
we're told, now Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. I don't, you know, Moses was a humble man. When you encounter depictions of Moses in print or in movies or on TV, you should ask yourself, how is his humbleness, his humility portrayed? <coughs> it would be easy for him to be anything but humble, right? Perhaps his humility is why he can have the conversations that he has with God. All those conversations are not about what Moses wants. It is about what the people need. It's at one point in Exodus 33 or so, God says to Moses, well, look, here's what we're going to do. This is so bad. This golden calf stuff is so bad that I'm going to start over with you, Moses. We're going to start over with you. You will be, you will be the man. And Moses says, no, 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 it can't be that way. You made promises. It can't be that way. That's Moses. He's a humble man. Which means what in human daily life? Well, I think it means that for when Miriam and Aaron start talking against him, it's not his inclination to defend himself. Does that make sense, Patty? Yes. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want to start lifting himself up or something in response to their questions and gossip, I say. So, verse 4, At once Yahweh said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, Come out to the tent of meeting, all three of you. It's a little back when my mom would shout, would shout out, Scott, Stephen, Allen, come here. So the three of them went out. They go out to the tabernacle. Then the Lord came down on a pillar of cloud. He stood. This is all metaphor, right? He stood at the entrance to the tent. And he summoned Arian and Miriam. And when the two of them stepped forward, he said, Listen to my words. Who's now who's speaking to them? What is the text telling you? Who's speaking to them? God. God Yahweh. is. Yahweh himself. Then Yahweh come down, came down on a pillar of cloud. Yahweh stood at the entrance of the tent, summoned Aaron and Miriam, and when the two of them stepped forward, Yahweh said, Listen to my words. When there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, reveal myself to them in visions. I speak to them in dreams. But this is not true of my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house, meaning above everybody else. With him, I speak face to face. Again, speaking of this relationship that Moses has with God. When with him, God says, I speak face to face, clearly, and not in riddles. He sees the form of Yahweh. Now, Yahweh isn't a man. Yahweh is not a woman. God, Yahweh does not have a body. God doesn't have a visible form in that way. It's a way of speaking of the intensely personal relationship that God has with Moses. And then God says, Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? So God says to them, Well... If, good thing we're about over because the lawn people are here. Yes. So, oh, it's very loud. well, why don't you come around, Patty, because it's almost okay. 4.15. So God basically says to them, Miriam and Aaron, why weren't you afraid? Afraid to speak of Moses in this way. He's not going to really defend himself the way that he should. He's a very humble man. But you should have known who I am and the relationship that I have with Moses. Haven't you seen that? Why could you speak? 
how can you speak against Moses? So when we come back next week, we will see what God's handling of this is. You see how intimately God is connected with every part of this story. Yes. It's fabulous. Fabulous. It reminds us that God is God is not active in this world only in the really giant things we God is busy and active in all the small parts of life. Intimately involved. And and we we need to not shove God away because every day God wants to be and is involved. So Okay. Reading that it, right away, I don't know why, but the thought went to me that, of course, this is exactly what happened to Jesus. The people in his own town were not afraid to speak against him. His own siblings, half-siblings, did not believe that he was God. And they talked about him. Um, you know, the highest priest, all of that, wanted to kill him. And, it's, it's, and there was no fear. There was no fear in doing that, just like there was no fear of them striking out against their brother. Yes. Yeah, okay. So one more thing. Yes. This is Patty's crazy ideas as we go through this. I know that nobody actually knows who wrote the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. And there's a lot of people that, um, you know, believe it was multiple people. And then a lot of Jewish tradition is that Moses wrote it. And many Christians believe well, Moses. Following the Jewish tradition, believe that Moses wrote all five books. So what was kind of funny a few verses back is he was the most modest man in the entire world. And I kind of wondered if Moses put that in there about himself. <laughs> Good point, honey. Anyway, I just thought Good that. Point. And I kind of thought, okay, if that's true, he obviously wasn't the most modest. Hence, perhaps Moses didn't write <laughs> yeah, all of it. Yes. Maybe he just wrote some, I don't know. I just I don't thought know. that was it's all impossible funny, to know. funny. Anyway, thank you all so much for being with us. We're so sorry. The, the long guys know they're not supposed to be here yet, but they're here and they're very noisy outside. We hope and pray you guys will have a rest of the day. will be great. Um, we hope we'll see some of you tomorrow in the Tuesday class and that all of us will gather here again next Monday. Next Monday. Yeah. You know then it. We'll, then we'll be off for a couple weeks. And you know what's going to happen tomorrow in the Tuesday class? What? David's going to die. <gasps> oh, wow. Yep. Yeah, wow. Yep. We're wow. there. Okay. Which then gets us <laughs> ready, right, kind of up to the starting <coughs> acts, right, when we come back yeah. after New Year's. You got it. In the book of Acts. Okay. You got it. Please join with me as we close. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day today. We thank you for Scott's teaching and helping us to understand um, this book of Numbers. We, um, we still have many questions, Lord, but we are, we are grateful to have somebody explain a lot of this to us. We pray, God, that you would continue to hold this group close. We pray, God, for your protection to keep us safe and to keep us healthy, Lord, and to keep on remembering, God, through this crazy, busy season we're in. And um, just, God, that truly the whole reason of this is to celebrate the birth of your son. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I promise that in Numbers we would finally get to a good theology-filled story. Yes. We finally did. In numbers 11. Well. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Adios, everybody. Bye, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.